Today's sermon is entitled, Tailbearing or Gossiping. Now, this is going to be a wild sermon, I guarantee it. And I hope and pray that you take it to heart because, you know what? We all, from time to time, can be accused of telling stories about other people that may or may not be true, but sharing those stories out there, and we know that we should not do that. I want to first start off here with the human brain. You can see the picture on the screen. The human brain has approximately 1.1 trillion cells. Three pounds is all it weighs. 1.1 trillion cells within three pounds of matter. That's impressive. The brain is an organ of the body, and it's truly remarkable, for it controls all the functions of the body, interprets information from outside the world, and embodies the essence of the mind and the soul. Even though the brain cannot perform calculations as fast as a K computer by Fujitsu, one of the fastest computers in the world, even though that computer is four times faster in processing calculations and can hold ten times more data than our human brain, the human brain is really impressive. Because you know what? It takes electricity. How much electricity it takes for the brain to work is approximately the amount it takes to light a small light bulb in comparison to how much it takes for that big old K computer, which is a massive amount. And the K computer is in a great big massive building, whereas the brain fits within our tiny little heads. That's impressive. Really impressive. Now, let's go a little bit a step further. That's calculations. What about our emotions? The K computer cannot process emotions, but we certainly can. We can not only process them, but we can also feel them. We feel anger, we feel fear, disgust, sadness, happiness, surprise, love. And ultimately, the brain is our source of creativity and artistic expression, of which the computer still has not mastered. Upon examining the human brain, I like to think at this point, we can say we are fearfully and wonderfully made, just like David said. And I think we certainly are. But the question that I have before you is, what are we going to do with those big, magnificent brains that we have? What are we going to do with them? You would think with such an amazing gift that humanity would use our brains, 1.1 trillion cells, in order to praise God the Father in heaven and to tell everybody all about Jesus. You would think that's what we would do with these brains. And yet between 10 and 60 thousand thoughts that we have per day, approximately 80% of them are negative. Can you imagine that? 80% of our thoughts are negative, and research says 95% of what we think today, we're going to think tomorrow. That's mind-boggling. What happened to remembering that we're fearfully and wonderfully made? What happened to taking the 1.1 trillion cells and using it to honor God instead of to tear down other people? Well, we're all created in the image of God, and we're descendants of Adam. This doesn't mean that we appreciate the miracle called life, and we certainly don't. Even though, even ever since, I think, Cain, remember Cain? He gets a little bit jealous of Abel, well, a lot jealous of his brother, and he kills him. Ever since that moment, we've had a love-hate relationship with each other. Did you know only 1% of the population are responsible for all the violent crimes in the world? 1%? And yet, which one of us, lest we think that we're off the hook on this sermon, which one of us has not said something bad about somebody else? We certainly have. While God gave us a freedom to think in any way that we want, this doesn't mean that our tongues are to be like a consuming fire. And this doesn't mean that we're supposed to tear down people who are created in the image of God. Now, I want to repeat that again, because that's really important. God is very clear. If you want to praise God the Father in heaven... You cannot do that while you're tearing down the people who are made in his image. James 3, 6 to 10. You can't. Because God won't accept praise from you when you're tearing other people down. Living in a world where the average person looks at their cell phone, checks in once every 12 minutes, tailbearing and gossiping has become the norm, has become modern day weapons that cuts far deeper than any knife could ever think of cutting. The sermon is going to review is it okay to tell bear? Is it okay to make up stories? Is it okay to gossip? Is it okay to do false statements about another person? Is it okay, not based on worldly standards, but what does God say? Is it a sin or is it not? Let's start off first by defining both slander and gossip. Slander is defined as an evil, malicious talk or lies intended to defame or destroy another person's reputation. Tailbearing is very similar, but tailbearing 
doesn't have quite that, that evil design behind it. In other words, I'm not thinking about destroying you, but at the same time, the effect is the same. I'm still spreading what I think is truth, but probably is falsehoods. And in other words, I'm going to sensational, groundless talk about somebody else. In the Bible, there's lots of different names for tail-bearing and slander. Now, I'm going to give you some of the names, and I want you to think very hard. Any of these names relate to you? I want you to think about that, because when I'm going through the sermon, I've got to honestly say, hey, you know what? There's been times when I've done some of these things to my own shame, and had to ask, God, forgive me. So I'm in the wrong here. And I've done this before. You know what? Does any of these names relate to you? Whispering. Do you do some of that? Do you do backbiting? Do you do evil surmising? Do you do a lot of babbling, a lot of tattling on other people, evil speaking? Do you defame other people's characters, bear false witness? Do you judge charitably towards somebody else? Do you raise false reports about them? Or do you just repeat matters all over the place? All of those items. And please go to the website, www.mckeesfamily.com. Look up the printed copy of the system. All of those are sins, according to the scriptures. I got the references for every one of those. That's a little bit scary, isn't it? Since one cannot know the thoughts and motives of another individual, there's no such thing as sharing factual information from one person to the next if they're not in the room. There's no such thing as that. We just simply don't know the mind of another person. Therefore, we cannot share truthfully what we think to be right to the other person. We're no guarantee we're going to have it right. We have no guarantee that we're going to get the same truth. All you got to do is turn on CNN News and look at what the news says about an event. Go to Fox News and look what they say. Go to ABC News and look at what they say. And go to all the other news stations and you're going to find out, lo and behold, people have different perspectives on the same event. And it's very hard to figure out what the truth ultimately is. Well, approximately 80% of our conversations, according to the numbers, are gossip and slander. Imagine that. 80% is negative. We already learned that stat, but now we find out 80% of it actually is gossip and slander. So we can see out of the 1.1 trillion cells that we have, what do we spend most of our time doing? Tearing one each other down. And, and now the question is, is that okay? Is that okay? Let's take a look at it. Number one. Let's start off with the obvious. Is it okay to slander somebody? Now, I'm going to ask the church, do you think it's okay? Raise your hands. You know what? Nobody put their hands up because obviously we don't think it's okay. And that would be right. Using our minds to think and speak, slanderous talk is an abomination unto God. Proverbs 6, 16, 19. Especially when it comes from evil intent. Matthew 15, 19. Luke 6, 45. And especially when we hate the other person. That's Psalms 41, 7 and Psalms 109, 3. Now again, I'm not going to give you all the references in this sermon, just a few. But please go to the website. You'll get the rest. In Mark 14, 53 to 65. Remember the story? Jesus gets taken in front of the Sanhedrin. Now, it's in the middle of the night. They don't have court in the middle of the night. So the first thing the reader is alerted to is, this is very unusual. The Sanhedrin are in a rush. They want to get Christ on that cross before the day of the Passover. So they want to get him up on that tree. They want to execute him. They want to get rid of their problem in their minds. The other thing that alerts the reader to is, this was a kangaroo court. This wasn't a legitimate court at all. It was a kangaroo court. And the chief priest and all the, the rulers of that synagogue already had their minds made up. They already had crucify him, crucify him in their minds. They already had that made up. It's no surprise in scripture, it tells us a whole bunch of false witnesses came forward. They made up a bunch of stories about Jesus to try to get him on that cross. The chief priest got a little bit flustered, we find out in Scripture, because he couldn't do it based on their testimonies. Because none of them made any sense. None of them did. It wasn't until the chief priest asked, Are you really saying you are the Son of God? Are you really saying you're God? Of course, Jesus said, you, As you say, yes, I am. And that's what got him on the cross for blasphemy. But in the end, these God-fearing Jews were so consumed with hatred, they would accept any testimony and they would provide any testimony in order to defame Jesus' name. Many times I think we're like the Sanhedrin, we're like a lynch mob trying to pervert justice. With pride and holiness in our eyes and anger, ultimately our lying lips, they just go blah, 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 back and forth against somebody else because we want to destroy them. We want to assassinate their character. We want to make sure they pay the price. 
bearing false witness. Now, it is wrong. All you got to do to go to the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 16, it is wrong. It is a sin to bear false witness. And as a sin, this particular sin, God hates seeing anyone commit it. Proverbs 6, 16, Leviticus 19, 16. God does not like us spreading false witness, period. So it's definitely a sin. So if you raised your hand and said, yes, pastor, slander is a sin, you are 100% right. Despite most Christians knowing this, that slander is a sin, it is the weapon of choice for most people inside of churches, especially when conflict breaks out. While almost every single Christian would say, you know, I don't hate the person so much that I physically want to harm them. I would never dream of doing that. Come on, I'm civilized. They would have absolutely no problem whatsoever in making up a story and assassinating another person's character. No problem at all in doing that. They feel justified, after all. A cardinal vice of intolerance of the differentiated others within the church has blinded many self-righteous Christians and have left them, these, these agents of reconciliation that Scripture calls us, as impotent. Dare I say even worse, we're the instigators of the conflict. To justify their aggression and often false testimonies, most Christians, what they'll do is they'll say, look, you know what? I'm going to use the 1.1 trillion cells that God gave me, and I'm going to look at all the things I don't like in your life, and I'm going to make you a demon, because then I'll feel justified making up a false story about you. After all, you deserve it. After all. What a shame it is that the church is supposed to be God's hospital for sinners to recover, to confess those sins and become more like Jesus, and yet they are tearing each other down one by one. Yet it has become a place, I think, where people battle for political supremacy. They're supposed to be serving each other, aren't we? Since hatred is part of the sinful nature, Galatians 5.20, make every effort to see other people as Jesus Christ saw them on the cross. He was willing to forgive them and make room for them. Make room for one another. Celebrate our differences is what we should do. Learn to love and respect and build each other up in the faith. That's not what we do. We spread bad rumors. Now, while most Christians agree slander is a sin, we got by that one fairly easily, now we've got to go to the second section and ask the next question. Is it truly a sin to use our minds to think up negative things about another person because they've attacked us? In other words, John Doe's sitting out in the congregation, he's minding his own business, or Jane Doe, and she's sitting back saying, you know what, all is good. And somebody attacks her. Somebody makes up a false story about her. So she sits back and says, whoa, what a demon you are. What a bad person you are. Now is Jane Doe or John Doe justified in making up a false story about the perpetrator and fighting back? That's a little bit tougher, isn't it? In Genesis chapter number 3, we get a really nice story about this. You know, here you got Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, and they got absolutely everything. There's nothing that they actually don't have. And they're sitting back saying, well, this is good, everything's exciting. They didn't have any real commands to follow except for two that I know of, two big ones. Not really. Take care of the Garden of Eden. Okay, well, that one's not too hard. And do not, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two simple, basic commands. And, of course, they broke the, they broke the tree. They went and got the fruit from the tree and ate it. So one day God, he shows up, and he's in the Garden of Eden, and he's, he's walking in the cool of the land, and he goes and looks at them. He says, where are you? They said, well, we're hiding. God says, why? What has changed from yesterday and the day before and the day before that and today? You never hid before. Why are you hiding now? And Adam says, you know what? God, God, you don't understand. You know, Eve, that, that helper that you made for me over there, the one you made, God, she deceived me. See, Adam was very quick when God said, what's going on, Adam? Something's not right here. Why are you hiding? Adam was very quick to lay blame to God. God was right in what he said. He wasn't spreading malicious talk. Not at all. He was saying the truth. Adam, where are you? And Adam goes back and he attacks because he feels he's justified. We're not justified in attacking anyone. We're just not justified. Especially when we're trying to say stuff that is wrong. Trying to destroy another person's reputation or defame their witness 
is a sin. And I'm going to give you three reasons. I am sure there's probably more. But I'll give you just three particular reasons. Just three. Let's start off. Number one. First, in Matthew 7, 3 to 5, Jesus states, one is not to judge a brother or sister until they've confessed the planks in their own eye. In other words, if you feel you've been wronged, first check out why. Have I really been wronged? Is a person really making up stories and lies? Or is there a grain of truth in there? Maybe I better confess that sin. Number two. Second, in Matthew 5, 38 to 48, Jesus says, you say, Jesus says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. He says, but that's hogwash. Jesus says, use your 1.1 trillion cells to think about good about other people. And when an enemy arrives and they attack you, do good to them. Love them. Pray for them. Do good to them. Wow, that's tough teaching. I don't know about you. That's really tough. And number three, despite how good our sources are, that we got negative information from in the first place, whether it's from our 1.1 trillion cells within our mind or whether it's from somebody else. No matter how good that information is, we cannot crawl up in the mind of somebody else. Therefore, we don't know the full truth. We need them to understand what the truth is in relation to their life. And anytime we spread something that we think is true, in most cases it's not completely true, and therefore we're slandering them. And we know that's definitely a sin against God. When quarrels and fights become the norm, and they become as frequent as praying and worshiping, such a church is soon going to close their doors. And I've seen this happen way too often. Our insatiable desire for retribution can keep even the best of Christians in a cycle of violence for absolutely ever. I found this uh, particular illustration on the internet, and it was a fellow named Sam O'Neill. And he said, in 2006, Australian scientists discovered the cause of mysterious disease that killed thousands of Tasmanian devils on the island of Tasmania, the coast of Australia. You can see the picture of the Tasmanian devil on the screen. The scientists initially believed the deaths were caused by a virus. However, their research ultimately uncovered a rare and a fatal cancer. They named it devil fascial tumor disease, or DFTD. Thank goodness they gave me a big abbreviation. What is strange, according to the scientist, ultimately, Anne-Marie uh, Peirce, is that the abnormalities in the chromosomes of the cancer cells of each and every one of these creatures were identical. And she said, wow, hold on a second, that's important. This means that the disease began from the single mouth of a single sick devil. The ferocious little animals, according to the research, facilitated the spread of this disease by, by biting its neighbors and squabbling for food, which, according to persons, was natural behavior for the Tasmanian devils. Devils jaw, wrestle, and bite each other quite a bit, usually in the face and around the mouth. And bits of the tumor broke off into the other devils and stuck inside of their mouth, and they got the same cancer. Over the course of several years, in fact, the devils continued the inflict these deadly wounds with their mouths. Consequently, this disease spread at an alarming rate, approximately wiping out 40% of the populations of these devils. A similar fate threatens a church, I think. We backbite. We fight. Those words that I gave you earlier, describing and defining what, what, what tail-bearing and uh, slander is, we do those all the time. And it threatens the church, very much so. Because we don't have deep peace and So Retribution is the biting cancer that is responsible for so many church splits and so many church closes. It's absolutely sad. If our churches are to survive this me generation, then we need to teach each other. Love one another. Love each other. Build each other up in the faith. Stop looking for to hate each other and to be angry towards one another. Look for the good in one another. Support each other. That's important. One time just a really quick uh, story, a joke, I guess. I'm not very good at telling jokes, so I hope this one comes across right. Three people are fishing, and of course, if they're with me, they're not catching any fish. So anyway, you can almost imagine the throwing. And there it goes, sploosh, it's in the water. And they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're not catching anything. And then they throw it again, sploosh. And everybody gets excited. They think maybe a fish jumped, and they realize, no, no, that's just, you know, somebody else's hook falling in the water. And so, hey, we're kind of bored. So they decide, let's play a game. Let's each of us, as pastors, they know how to keep things confidential. 
They said, let's play a game. Each take a turn confessing our sins. They said, okay, that sounds like a good game. I think we can do that one. And the very preacher speaks up and he says, you know what? I think the sin that I've had in my life is sometimes I like to sit at the beach and I like the beautiful women. I like to eye them. I like to think about them a little bit more than I should. All of them went, ooh. Wow, you do that? Okay, that's a big sin. The second preacher said, you know what? i got to confess a sin too. I race track every now and then, and I put a lot of money down on the on the park. I do that from now and from time to time, way too often. And they went, ooh, that's not good. That's a big sin. Then the third preacher, wondering, why aren't you participating here, buddy? What's your biggest sin? And he looked at me very sheepishly, and he said, my biggest sin is gossiping. Wow. Isn't that true? Well, it's like questionably a sin. What are we supposed to use our minds about? Our minds to think about. It's certainly not chatter and talk about somebody else. It's the gossip. Really? The answer is Paul's letter to Timothy. He warned the young widows that he, you have in your congregation. He told Timothy, be very careful of them. They got and they're going from house to house, house to house, and they're spreading this these supposed facts of people that nobody needs to know, and they're spreading the place and it's causing a lot of problems. Whether was malicious or not, God meddling in other people's affair was absolutely true, according to Paul, because it was breaking down relationships and her be a Christ. Gossip is not only a sin, Leviticus 18, 18, uh, 18, 8, Leviticus 19, 18, 29 to 30, 2 Corinthians 12, 20, and more, because Facts that are spread are absolutely absurd. They're not real truth at all. And on top of that, because it does break down people's relationships. In other words, when you hear somebody inside the church talk about you, it cuts deep. It's the body of Christ. And it creates conflict. And God says, there are six sins. Remember this? This is Proverbs 6.19. There are six sins, God says. I, don't, I hate them. He said, don't do these sins. The number six. One of them was bearing five. I think that's number six. And then you go to the one. God says, I find this detestable. I like this one. He says, that's creating this by the body of Christ. And I like this myself. Somebody was proud that they were creating dissension in some Christ. They were proud that they were sending home. They were happy that people were coming to church because they were battle in their minds. Very sad. Even though God says that's detestable. As ones who are going to give an account of the Lord Jesus Christ, we get consistent with our tongues speaking only those words to edify and build up the body of Christ. So, a sermon with some very practical advice. What do you do when somebody slanders about you? My heart goes out to you. It's easy. I know that what's like somebody slander you. To have somebody slander you for many years and be rude about it. I know what that feels like very much. And I want to say there's some steps that we definitely need to take. Hey, number one, be so careful about this. In the lying lips and deceitful tongues, pray. Protection. Pray. I like that word. Pray that God will give you the right counsel. Don't go to the battlefield of Satan without the and certainly not without God's blood. Pray first. God take you. Second thing, and prayer, invite God in your heart to make sure whatever you have that you deal with it. Important. Look at yourself. It's always tempting to look at the other person. They're gossiping. They're slamming me. The first step is, the first step is to look at ourselves. What have, I done? what have I done wrong? Number three, in the face of slander and gossip, Enable one to continue to love that person. Gossip against us, the first reaction is anger, strife towards that person. 
It's not love at all. No, the apostle go to the person. Tell them, you know what? Things not right. Deal with it one on one. Always possible. Some person doesn't want to see you. Doesn't want to talk to you. You know what? I think there's another another step that I want to make sure you're aware of, and that is let us go. It's ultimately in scripture that we're supposed to forbear another. If small and minor don't sweat, if somebody wants to draw you into it, avoid it at all costs. Watch and pray. It's so very important that you have such a good and and justifiable life in front of God that you're absolutely ashamed they attacked you in the first place. So time, instead of trying to get retribution, thinking how you could do good to you and how you could serve God with a good heart and everything else of itself. And if the person is persecuting you because of the Lord Jesus Christ, hands and knees and praise God. That you can see to be persecuted. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to finish final thought. Minds, one trillion seven are fearfully and wonderfully but they're not to gossip and slander other people. They are to build one another up in the of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, is it to slander and gossip a person? It is. It is. And God doesn't like it, not one bit, even slightly. If you're the one doing Bringing gossip in a lot of us. And if somebody's against you, go back to the seven steps. Again, go to www.mckinley.com. This whole thing is right there. Print it in, quote, near the that I used. I didn't tell you all. But it's all for you. And please do it piece by piece. We do need peace in our church. And this is the only way to get by God with love, respect, and loving each other. To that, and amen.